going to tell you the story of the failure of the Fair Act 25. This was a story about how a couple lines of code written by programmers in the 1980s became more deadly than the powerful radiation that the code was handling. The potential failures of software engineering can often be overlooked because code failing will not cause something extremely obvious like a bridge failing or a train derailing or a power station exploding at first. It can be something as small and inconspicuous as an error message with no descriptor and an error that was never anticipated by the manufacturers. A story takes place in 1983 when the Fair Act 25 medical linear accelerator had just become commercially available. This was a brand new innovation in using radiation to treat cancer. Older Fair Act models were extremely large because they required many hardware implements to ensure that the machine was safe. They were extremely labor intensive to operate and took a lot of time, meaning that less patients could be treated. The software engineer, engineers at Atomic Energy Canada Limited were sure that they could limit the space that the Therac took up while ensuring that it was safe by using software to ensure that it was safe instead of using the hardware implements. I'm going to quickly explain how we use radiation to treat cancer because it's important for the context of talking about the software of the situation. So we've discovered that a beam of radiation can penetrate human skin without causing damage over a calculated distance. Using this theory, we can take a beam of radiation and use it to penetrate the skin, but it is only harmful to the tumor within the skin, basically. Okay, so there were three modes of operation of the Therac 25. A field light, which was used to position the beam over the patient, it was just light. An electron beam, which was a high energy beam that was used to treat tumors that were close to the surface of the skin. And a megavolt X-ray treatment, which was used to treat deeper lying tumors. The megavolt X-ray beam is an extremely higher intensity than the electron beam, but the electron beam can still be dangerous if it is not properly implemented. So how did a machine that was trusted by medical professionals and touted as extremely safe by the company turn into a murder weapon? Over two years, there were six reported victims and three deaths. And this is not the fact that around the time 56% of hospitals did not hospitals did not report 56% of incidents that happened with their machinery. So we do not know the extent to which the Fair Act 25 did harm. Safe that an overdose is virtually impossible is what the manufacturer of the Fair Act 25 told the hospitals it was selling it to. They were sure that there was absolutely no way that the software that they had written could fail. So how did it happen? Okay, so here's an image of what the Therac 25's control terminal would have looked like to the technician. The control, the technician would have selected the mode of operation, selected the amount of radiation that needed to be delivered to the patient, and they would perform any of the safety checks that the software gave to them. And then when they were told it was safe to do so, they would start operation on the patient. And obviously this is 1983, so the interface was extremely simple and only a limited amount of information could be displayed. In June, July, and December of 1985, the software of the Fair Act 25 behaved in unexpected ways, which delivered massive amounts of radiation to patients. In one incident, the operator turned the machine on and immediately the patient was burnt by the ray. In other incidents, the operators were told that dosage had not been delivered the first time and they were prompted to try again, when in fact, they had, there had been a dosage delivered and the machine was not reporting that back to them. There was minimal response from the AECL, Atomic Energy Canada Limited. Um, they did say that there could be some potential issues with the turntable that operated the beam modes. So they did some hardware fixes on those, but nothing else. They maintained that it was impossible for this machine to deliver overdoses of radiation. 
Um, the victims in these incidents suffered lifelong disabilities from the radiation that was delivered to them. And one woman needed to have one of her breasts amputated as a result of the radiation. In March 1986, false error messages from the software caused two lethal doses of radiation to be delivered to the patient. The patient died months later. AECL does an investigation but found nothing wrong with the Therac 25 and still maintained that an overdose was impossible. April 1986, more false error messages and another patient dies from overexposure. The Therac 25 is briefly taken out of commission, looked into by the FDA. The FDA requested some small hardware updates to be made and right after that, it was reinstated. January 1987, a Therac 25 malfunction causes, causes a condition to deliver two overdoses of radiation to a patient, and the patient dies from overexposure. All cases of the deaths included an, an error message called malfunction 54 to appear on the screen. Malfunction 54 was not described in the manual that was given to the technicians. It was a cryptic message that would show up and they could easily bypass it by pressing P on the keyboard to proceed. Two technicians at a hospital fed up after the deaths and the lack of response from AECL, sat at a computer for hours and hours trying to replicate the conditions which caused this malfunction to come up. And eventually they did. They figured out how to cause, how to turn a medical linear accelerator into a murder weapon. If the technician accidentally entered the wrong beam mode into the terminal, over the next eight seconds, the machine could not receive any new information. They had no idea. So um, say you wanted to put the machine into field light mode, but you accidentally pressed X for the megavolt X-ray mode. That's fine. You can just correct the mistake and reset the beam but this was not the case because the machine could not receive new information from the program. It stayed in the megavolt X-ray mode, even though the terminal was telling them that it was in field light mode and the patients were given high doses of radiation with nothing in place to stop the radiation because the turntable needed to be in place for it to prevent overdoses. The first three deaths that occurred after an investigation was done, not deaths, the first three incidents that occurred after an, after an investigation was done were found not to be due to a hardware issue with the Therac 25, as the manufacturer had claimed. It was because of a counter that was being used to check if the turntable was in a safe position. So when the turntable is set, it needs to make sure that it is filtering the radiation effectively so that it does not overdose you with radiation. However, they checked this using a variable that was equal to zero. And it would check, um, and if it was unsafe, it would not be equal to zero. It would make adjustments. And then once it was safe, it would be equal to zero. However, this counter could only count up to 255, which meant on the 256th check, it briefly became zero again before counting up. If a technician was unfortunate enough to check if they could proceed with the operation while the counter was at zero, the patient could possibly be exposed to a massive dose of radiation with nothing to stop it from the machine. February of 1987, the Therac 25 was shut down and thoroughly investigated by the FDA and the manufacturer. They updated it with multiple hardware safeguards to prevent further incidences and they scrutinized the code and the program was rewritten to make sure that these bugs did not exist. The Therac 25 is still in use today. This is not meant to scare anyone because there was nothing wrong with the Therac 25. It was a good piece of software and it did immeasurable good to cancer patients and it still is doing it. The only thing wrong with the machine was the software that they had put into the machine to use it. This is a huge part of the history of software engineering. You write code that does impact people's lives and it can be very small or very big as I've talked about. 
And although we're not all writing code that can, you know, cause life or death situations, the potential for a piece of software still needs to be recognized by everyone, I think.